Among the historically anomalous gathering of geniuses who were the signers of the American Declaration of Independence and many of whom gathered later to write the American Constitution was that Renaissance figure, that incredibly interesting man who became our third president, Thomas Jefferson. Though more famous lately for having sired a family bloodline through a mistress who happened to be a slave on his farm, other than being a fairly typical 18th century scoundrel, he was also a man who had very many interests in which he was well ahead of his time. He studied architecture, botany, animal husbandry, agriculture, medicine, surveying, government, and of personal interest to me and those of us in the progressive Christian movement, he was beginning to dabble in historical Jesus studies. He didn't have much to go on beyond his own intuition, but he was an uncommonly smart guy. Those must have been heady days. Once the war for independence had been won and this robust gathering of thinkers stood on the starting line of what would be the most rapid advance in technology, transportation, communication, and philosophy that the world has ever seen. They were both liberated and they were compelled towards greatness. They looked backwards for guidance from great civilizations of human history but they also gave themselves permission to do entirely new and different things. Most of our nation's founders were either deists or they were nominally Christian. It was part of the uh, intellectual movement of Europe at the time to be pretty well dismissive of traditional religion. And as indifferent as we think that we are about religion in the United States today, historians have speculated that something like 2% of the population of the United States actually attended church at the time that the Constitution was written, compared to somewhere around 15 to 17 percent today. So as bad as we think we have it, things were much more indifferent back then. The reason you didn't run into any traffic jams on your way here this morning is because even on Easter in the United States, we only have about 20 percent of people that actually go to church. An American president couldn't do it today because our nation is much, much more religiously conservative, even though not that many people go to church, than it was two and a half centuries ago. But President Jefferson read the Christian Gospels and felt that there was a message there that was vital to preserve, but that that message had been obscured by a layer of magic and superstition. To recover the teachings of Jesus, Jefferson said in a letter to a friend, we should have to strip off the artificial vestments in which the teachings of Jesus have been muffled by priests who have transvested them into various forms as instruments of riches and power to themselves. He was pretty suspicious of clergy. He removed from the New Testament resurrection texts, all references to miracles, all references to the divine, and preserved the moral teachings of Jesus, which he then published as the moral teachings of Jesus. And he published that book at taxpayer expense so that he could give a copy to every member of Congress. That would get you um, impeached today because we're a lot more conservative than they were then. But he somehow, without any background or training in historical Jesus studies, was able to just intuitively say that all of the miracle and magic part can't be true, so what is true? What he didn't know was that there were a number of historical precedents for that way of thinking. When I was in seminary, we called those people heretics. In the early centuries, there was Arianism and Ebonism, both of which argued for a human, not a divine view of Jesus, but those views of Christianity were made illegal and stamped out after Constantine's conversion to the Christian faith. In the past century, better equipped scholars from the early part of the 20th century tried once again 
to rescue the message of Jesus from this obscuring layer of false cloaks of magic and superstition. The names of Albert Schweitzer, Paul Tillich, Rudolf Bultmann would be among the more familiar to us who were members of, highly published members of, a rising tide of biblical, theological, and historical scholars who worked to bring rational thought back into the practice of faith and to deliver the church from its addiction to magical thinking. Now, when Tim Rice wrote the lyrics to Jesus Christ Superstar, he was only in his mid-20s, and I have to admit that makes me a little bit angry because he didn't have the benefit of any particular theological training beyond his parochial school experience. I find that almost impossible to believe that he could have grown up in the church of the 1960s, which is the church I grew up in, and I had no idea that this level of theological sophistication existed. The lyrics of Jesus Christ Superstar do not, in my opinion, rise to the level of the work of Paul Tillich or Rudolf Bultmann, but it does have a better beat, does it? <laughs> can dance to it. Were it not for this music, I doubt that I ever would have gotten around to reading Bultmann and Tillich. Tim Rice claimed that he was trying to tell the story of Jesus from the perspective of Judas. And to a certain degree, I think he does that very successfully. Though there's also, I think, tremendous power in the words uh, that are sung by Mary and Pilate and even Caiaphas as we take their perspectives on the Jesus of history. I regret that you, our friends on YouTube and iTunes, um, will not get to hear the music that's being performed live here today. Unfortunately, Andrew Lloyd Webber still defends his copyright uh, regulation of this music pretty tightly, so we can't reproduce it online. But I do encourage you to dust off your old albums or videos and give the music another listen. For those of us here in Springfield, though, I'm pleased to be able to join you in experiencing the hearing of this music as we continue in this church to try to rescue Jesus from the magic of the traditional church. You've been watching a progressive Christian video from the Community Christian Church of Springfield, Missouri. We encourage our viewers to donate to our efforts in feeding the homeless and hungry of our community. Write to us at Reverend Dr. Ray at AOL.com for more information.